Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be back. <clears throat> it's been a while to get through that virus, and, uh, but it's certainly great to be here, and it's good to see you all. So, um, what I thought I would do today is just touch on uh, a couple of bills, and then maybe save a few minutes, because I'm hoping that you'll have some questions that you, you may have. Uh, but we did, we did just wrap up the, the, uh, for summer break. Uh, it was uh, two weeks ago today. Uh, we, we finished up the operating budget. It was about uh, 1.30 in the morning is when we wrapped that up. And, um, and now we're on summer break until the middle of September. And uh, so um, what I typically stay busy with through, through the summer months is a lot of times I'll have two, three, sometimes four events a day. And um, the district that I represent is the Vyance, Pauley, Van Wert counties, and then half of all of this county. So it's a pretty big district, geographically speaking, and um, there tends to be a lot of activity, obviously, through the summer months. So, uh, but I love it. I, this is, uh, I was telling Jane, this is really the, uh, you know, when I'm in Columbus, and typically when I'm in Columbus, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I live in the finance, and I usually leave the house around uh, about nine o'clock in the morning, and then I, and then I get home Thursday night, maybe around 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening. And uh, I'm fortunate, I'm one of the lucky legislators that I have family that lives in Columbus. Um, my son lives in Pickerington, and then my dad lives in Westerville. And both of them live about 16 miles from the state house. So uh, I'm pretty lucky in that way because it's, it, from my home to the, to the right where I, where I work, it's about a two hour and 35, two hour and 40 minute drive. So um, it's not a drive where you're just gonna go back and forth every day. Most of the legislators end up staying in hotels downtown. And uh, like I said, I'm lucky. I uh, typically have breakfast. My dad loves making breakfast for me. And, and it's really been a blessing in that sense. He's, my dad's 80 years old. And, and uh, if I hadn't become a state rep, he and I wouldn't be spending all this bonus time together. And it's been a blessing, that's for sure. Um, so, and when I'm in Columbus, it's we're dialing in on policy. When we're in Columbus, I mean, we are just, as a group, there's uh, 99 representatives, 33 senators. Um, we're, we are totally dialing on, on what we're there for, and that's working on policy to move Ohio forward. Um, and when I'm back in the district, like I said, like today, I'm, I'm you know, at different events, uh, rotary events, uh, festivals, uh, uh, fairs, you know, that's that time of the year. So um, this is an opportunity for me to reconnect, though, and, and really dial in on what it is that you all want me to be focusing on and what your concerns are. So um, certainly though, this is the part of my job I, I love the most. I know about it. Um, but I mentioned we wrapped up two weeks ago um, and that last evening there's two bills I wanna talk about that probably has gotten the most attention um, before we wrapped up and that's the operating budget. That's House Bill 110. That's the budget that runs the state of Ohio for two years. Uh, K through 12 funding, and I keep, you like that? You like the fair school funding? You like the bomb cut formula? Okay, great. Um, and I'll explain in a second. Um, but K through 12 funding, Medicaid, law enforcement, uh, all of that is part of that. It's a two year, two year budget. Uh, about, this was $74 billion to run Ohio for two years. Um, some of the highlights of the operating budget I just mentioned, um, and, and all the school administrators I've spoken with over the last year, two years, has been very supportive of the, of the fair school funding formula. Basically, if you all recall, um, the Ohio Supreme Court declared that Ohio school funding formula uh, was unconstitutional, and that was, decision was made almost 30 years ago, back in the early 1990s. And, uh, and to, basically for the last 25, 30, 25 years or so, that, that can has been just been kicked down the road because it's so, it's such a big issue to try to take on. And, uh, but fortunately, uh, two representatives about three years ago decided they were gonna to try to solve this issue. Uh, and that's Bob Cup, who's from Lima, and he's actually the Speaker of the House at this point. And then John Patterson from uh, but Lake County, who's since turned out. Uh, but John and Bob took this on, and, and uh, they've come up with um, what I consider a, a really good plan going forward, um, much fairer, Typically, basically the old formula didn't work. I mean, it didn't even apply to any of the schools. We had to patch 
it was just a bunch of patchwork um, where we had a minimum amount the school would get and a maximum to cap schools and really unfair. You know, like your own Tangies and your new Albanies, um, they were taking it on the chin, you know, they're paying a lot of taxes and, and not seeing that money coming back through their schools. And, and then you had the impoverished schools, say, you know, in Southeast Ohio, where, you know, they don't have a tax base. So, you know, basically it was, it was a Robin Hood type situation where the, the wealthier schools were, were uh, subsidizing the, the you know, the more impoverished schools. But I think we got a good plan in place, Keith. Um, it's going to cost us a lot of money, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a great investment. It's in our children. Uh, it's going to cost about six billion dollars and we're going to face this in over six years uh, but it, it had overwhelming support with the republicans and democrats so that was a key facet of the operating budget we have 250 million dollars in the budget for broadband expansion which is critical to rural parts of ohio um, you know obviously going through the virus situation our kids were having to learn from home um, you know farmers depend on um, strong good broadband to run their machinery businesses you know think about all the employees that were sent home and were working from home you know if you didn't have good access to broadband you were at a major disadvantage and certainly one of my biggest concerns and something i'm constantly focused on is how do we bring our children back home how do we bring them back to hicksville how do we bring them back to defiance um and this is this is part of the equation you know, we don't, we all, you know, we don't want all of our kids living in Chicago and Columbus. Um, and this was critical, what, we, what we're doing here with this broadband expansion. So $250 million, and basically what it'll do, this money would be used to kind of finish out that last stretch, we call it the last mile, uh, to get to the, the homes that are hard to get to, where a, a uh, internet company basically is saying, we can't afford to take you know, the broadband out to this part of the county because it's not feasible to do it. It's too expensive. That's where this money comes in. It, it helps offset those costs um, because, you know, we've got to have good broadband throughout Ohio. And, and it's a state thing, too. I mean, you, you, we're competing with your neighboring states, and, you know, we want those, their kids to come here. That's what we want. So, um, the H2 Ohio program, uh, that's a program that was started by Governor DeWine in the last budget. Uh, and, and the purpose of that funding, the H2 Ohio funding, is to improve water quality throughout Ohio. A major, foc of it, major focus of it, though, is on the Maumee River watershed. And in the first budget, there was about uh, $170 million. Uh, and nearly all of that money went to 14 counties in northwest Ohio, including Defiance County. In this budget, there's $170 million in there again. Uh, and that money goes to ODNR, it goes to Ohio EPA, it goes to Ohio Department of Agriculture. The bulk of it going to Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, and again, there's $170 million in, in this budget for the same program. We've expanded it 10 counties. We've gone a little further east and a little further south. It's generally still the Ma Maumee River watershed. And obviously the focus is on the Maumee River and Lake Erie. Um, but this money does go throughout Ohio. Uh, EPA uses it to help uh, folks that have uh, leaking septic systems. You know, it's too expensive for some folks to be able to replace their septic tanks. That's where the EPA comes in and this program applies. Uh, farmers who want to put in filter strips uh, on, their, on their property or wetlands, ODNR is in charge of wetlands. Um, and we know this is working. We know this program's working. The data is already indicating that we're making progress. Um, so there's $170 million in, in the budget for H2 Ohio with the potential to expand it an additional $130 million, depending on how revenue comes in throughout the next year and a half, two years. So if we have a surplus in revenue, um, we've given approval to take an additional $130 million on top of the 170 we've already designated. So potentially, there could be $300 million being used in this H2 Ohio program, which um, is, like I mentioned, is really, I'm, I'm, we're very confident that it's paying dividends. Um, there's a uh, tax cut in the budget. It's, uh, it's a 3% tax cut. That's about $1.6 billion for Ohioans. Uh, we've reduced the tax brackets from five to four. 
Uh, the high end went from 4.9% to 3.9%. Uh, our goal, our goal in the next budget two years from now, our goal is to go to a flat tax in the state of Ohio. One bracket, flat tax, hopefully under 3%. That's our goal. And uh, I think we're going to do it. I think we're going to do it. We, we, I'm, I'm confident. And again, that's a competition thing. Um, you know, you look at Florida, flat tax. Texas, flat tax. Tennessee, flat tax. Um, North Carolina just went to a flat tax. Arizona just went to a flat tax. It, it's a competitive thing, and, and we want to make taxes as simple as possible in Ohio and as fair as possible. To me, that's fair. A flat tax, everybody pays their, their fair, their equal share. So, uh, so those are some of the highlights of the budget. Uh, I mentioned seventy-four billion dollars. Probably that was my third budget. Okay, I'm in my third term. That budget was the most conservative budget that we passed in my in my term, my my five years in Columbus. Uh, probably overspent a little bit. If I I'd like to have reeled it in a little bit. Um, but what we're spending on was very was focused on the right right things, and I feel really good about that. Um, revenue continues to come in over estimates. We finished the year with a revenue surplus of uh, 1.5 or 1.6 billion dollars, and we underspent by two billion dollars. So the state of Ohio is really in great shape financially, very, very strong financially. That's what allowed us to do the 1.6 billion dollar tax cut for everybody. So, um, and that's law. The governor signed that on June 30th, and um, and, and the. Uh, Appropriations in it take effect immediately. So our fiscal year started July 1st. Another bill I did want to touch on here that is very relevant to this part of Ohio, and, and I'm confident a lot of you have probably been following along in this, but it's Senate Bill 52, and, and that deals with wind and solar development in Ohio. And uh, what this and the governor signed it into law yesterday. Before this became law in Ohio. If a window or solar developer came into the state, um, for them to um, gain their certification to proceed, uh, it simply took approval by what's called the Ohio Power Siting Board. The Ohio Power Siting Board is uh, there's seven people that make up the, the siting board, seven voting members, there's four non voting members. Uh, the seven voting members are all non elected bureaucrats that live in Columbus. And um, they're the ones who give the go-ahead. They, they're the, ultimately they're the ones who, who give this, this certificate to the developer to proceed. Very little, very little local input prior to this bill passing. Essentially, um, the developer was required by law to hold two town hall type meetings where citizens could come and they could ask questions, they could voice their concerns. Uh, but basically a check check mark for the process and typically once a project got to the Ohio Power Site Board it was it was always approved regardless of what sort of opposition might be back in the community and that was wrong that was wrong so I introduced a bill back in early February uh, it was House Bill 118 with uh, Representative Dick Stein from Norwalk and then uh, Senator Rob McCulley from Napoleon and Senator Bill Reinecke out of Tiffin, they also um, introduced a companion bill, which was Senate Bill 52. And what I mean by that, they were identical bills, absolutely identical bills. And the reason you would do that is you don't know which bill is going to get through which chamber first. And, and in this situation, it was Senate Bill 52 that got out of the Senate first. So it became, it became the horse. It came over to the House. Our bill, House Bill 118, peeled off to the side. We'd had like five or six hearings on our bill prior to Senate Bill 52 coming to the House. But you do that because we cleared the runway at that point and Senate Bill 52 could come flying through because we'd already did all the, the work up front. Um, so the governor signed it yesterday. And what this bill is, it, it, what it does, it, it, it doesn't prevent, it does not stop renewable, renewable development. It does not stop solar development. It does not stop wind development. What it does, is it gives more local input in the process. And the way the bill's written, going forward, 
and this will take effect like October the 9th or 10th is when this bill becomes effective. Um, what it will do going forward is, and I'll just make an ex give an example. If um, my cell phone for this, but in, let's say a uh, a wind developer, but it, it applies to wind or solar the same way. But let's say a wind developer wanted to come into, I'll use my hometown county where I grew up, Seneca County, which they wind is really looking hard at that part of Ohio. There is a corridor that goes through Ohio. And it, and it starts south of here, Paulde and Van Wert, even Mercer County, and it and it heads east, and it, then it works its way north up through Lake Erie, up through like Vermilion, Sandusky, Huron, up that way. So it kind of swaths right through there. That's that's what we call the wind corridor in Ohio. That's where you've seen the most interest in development. And Seneca County right now is right in the crosshairs. Um, but let's say, for example, a wind developer wanted to come into the southeast corner of Seneca County and they wanted to put up uh, a uh, 100 megawatt wind farm that was gonna involve 55 wind turbines that are 625 feet tall, which is how tall they're building them now, which these are babies down the road here. These are, these are, these are antiquated, they're, they wouldn't use these anymore. Uh, they're only like 325, 340 feet, the ones involved in Baylor County. They're obsolete already. The ones that are wanna put up now are 625 foot tall is a more efficient, the technology has just advanced that much in the last 10 years. This was all built 10, 11 years ago south of us. But let's say in this example, they want to come into that southeast corner of Seneca County. So what would be required and what will be required when this takes effect October the 9th is uh, way up front in the process, that wind developer would have to come, would have to would contact the, the Seneca County commissioners and they would have to inform them that they want to have a public meeting uh, to talk about their proposal, their project that they want to, they want to do. And in that meeting, they have, to, they have to provide three things. The type of generation, whether it's wind or solar, um, the capacity of the, of the facility, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts, whatever that is, and then the, then the, the, the footprint of the project. Here's where it's going to be in this corner of the county. At that point, that triggers a 90-day window where the county commissioners then, uh, they have to make one of three decisions, the county commissioners. One, they can uh, say no to the project. They can say no to the project, which means the project is, is stopped at that point, but that is subject to countywide referendum. So if there's enough support to try to referendum that decision, it becomes a countywide uh, referendum They'd go on the next general or primary uh, election. And in that example, even the folks within Tiffin would be able to vote on that, on that referendum. Not just the folks that live out in Attica and Republic, out in the country, but the entire county gets to vote on that if it goes to a referendum, if it goes to a referendum. And there's a certain threshold of signatures that are required to get it to the ballot, okay? That's their first option. The second choice the, the county commissioners have is they can say, Yes, you have our approval to go forward with this project in, the, in this corner of the county where you told us you were going to build it. But we're going to require that you make it smaller within that same footprint. Okay, that is also subject to countywide referendum. Okay, the third option they have is after 90 days, if they do nothing at all, the project's a go. Okay, and that is not subject to countywide referendum. So they have those three choices. If the job proceeds, um, then in addition, there will be two ad hoc members that are that are appointed to the Ohio Power Siting Board. I mentioned earlier there's seven voting members. Now you have nine, and those two individuals would be a county commissioner and a township trustee that lives in that footprint, or a designee of their choice. But it has to be somebody that lives in the footprint of the project, okay? And those two, ad hoc members, then they're voting members on the Ohio Power Siding Board on that project. And the idea behind that is that as that project, if it's going through the Ohio, because it still has to be approved by the Ohio Power Siding Board, even if the county commissioners, if they let that 90 days go by and nothing's done, that they're given their approval, it still has to go through the same OPSB approval process, okay? And it could be, it could be rejected in the end if they don't do things the way they're supposed to do. But by adding those two ad hoc members, that allows for more local input at that point in the process, and they can maybe make things a little better for the community. Um, so, um, 
this is something that in my six years as state rep, um, I, I can't tell you how many people have come to me, come to Rob McCulley asking for help, wanting to have more of a say in the matter. And that's what we've done here in this bill. So in the end, what this bill does, it allows wind and or solar development to occur where it's welcome and to be prevented where it's not welcome. For example, in Paulding County, wind and solar development is, is, is looked very favorably upon, okay? So I can't, I, I, with the three county commissioners there, I, I don't think this will stop any sort of wind or solar development at all. They're gonna allow those projects to move on. But if you get into to Van Wert County, or if you get over into Seneca County, where the, where the sentiment is just the opposite, um, likely those county commissioners are gonna say no to a lot of those projects unless they meet the community needs. So, um, so there you go, Senate Bill 52, and I know there's a lot of discussion on this solar project over in, uh, in uh, Sherwood. <coughs> that project, it looks like, will likely be grandfathered, and this bill, this law would not apply to that project. Um, but I, I've told some of those folks that if you, if you, if you are, don't like what they're doing or if you're opposed to that project, your best bet is to, to communicate with the Ohio Power Site Board to let them know how you feel. But, but in the future, any type of wind or solar project after October the 9th, this, this language is built, this is all would apply to. So, Okay, so that was a lot of, yeah. Do you guys have any questions? I know that was a lot there. Jobs in Ohio. There are so many companies right now with the COVID and uh, uh, extra stipends are getting through unemployment and different things. What is the state doing to counteract? There are, there are so many companies looking for workers. And it's to a point where it's a struggle and impact. Uh, I just heard the other day a friend of mine works in, in Auburn. They're, bus they're bringing people in from Boston oh. to work shifts in Auburn. Not putting them in hotels. I mean, it's a huge impact. Every factory got hiring, hiring signs, flags, or putting signs throughout the entire counties, other counties. Uh, is the state looking into how they can handle that within the next? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's, I hear that one more than anything wherever I go. You know, there's jobs galore and not enough people. Um, it's not just Ohio, obviously. No. That, that is a nationwide issue. And I don't know if anyone's figured this out yet. I mean, the good news, and I, I, I maybe folks that may disagree with me on this, but um, I'm glad Governor DeWine did away with the $300 bonus check two weeks ago, June 26th. That had to end. That was ridiculous, in my opinion. Um, and that has ended. And what I've, uh, what I've heard is that other states that have done that, they've seen it help take in their employment before going back to work. Um, but Mike, I tell you, that is, you know, that is such a difficult, I, with, with, you know, you combine that with, the, you know, the drug, the, the addiction that we have as a country, and I, we, we need more, we need more workers, and boy, Keith, we're pulling for you here. I'm trying to, I mean, we've got to, you know, it starts with, it, Families, right? Mom and dad raising their kids, help them make good decisions, giving them a great education. Uh, that's I think it all goes back there, right, Mike? But sure. I don't know what the short-term answer is, and I don't know. I haven't spoken with anybody that can give me a good one on that. But if you got any advice, I'm, I'll, I'll take it. I just heard Indiana, they're suing the state now because they were going to drop the, the $300 extra. Yeah, we're getting sued too. And they're, and they're listening to it. Yeah. Um, you have to listen to it. Indiana lost the suit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're in Ohio's being sued also right now. Okay. And we, could lose, being sued we are being sued already. We, we, we could lose. Um, we'll fight it. Uh, Hopefully we don't. But yes, yeah, isn't that nonsense? Yeah. Larry. Can uh, do anything with the governor being able to shut down the state going forward so we don't end up like Michigan? You talking about like the COVID? COVID? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank goodness I didn't touch on this, but you know, we did pass Senate Bill 22, which. He vetoed it, right? No. He, well, yeah, he vetoed it, but we overrode his veto. Okay. It's law. 
Yeah, it's law now. So, God forbid, God forbid we ever experience anything like that again. But if we did in the state of Ohio, whether it's 10 years from now, 100 years from now, we have rewritten the law so that the General Assembly now is part of the conversation and we don't have one individual making all of these decisions for us. And in this way that Senate Bill 22 is written is the, the health director and the governor can still call, you know, issue the, the state of emergency, they can still issue the health orders, but what it does is it allows the General Assembly to weigh in and we can actually rescind the state of emergency within 30 days and we can rescind the health order in, in five minutes if, if we're all present. I mean, immediately we can rescind the health order if we disagree with it. So that is current law. Hopefully, God willing, we never have to use that in the future. Right. But we, we, we got that correct, finally. That was very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. I don't? Uh, in the education bill, mm -hmm. Ed Choice, where I like some parents to the center, gives the Catholic Lutheran School, Baptist. Uh, is there any funding for them in there, or do they have to be certain right there? Um, yes, there is. There is. Um, and I, I'm trying to think what that threshold of poverty was increased to. I think it was either 250 or 300%. And um, for the Ed Choice program, yeah. um, we froze the schools. I think we froze the schools. I'm not 100% I'm not sure about that. But I do know this the money for the Ed Choice scholarship, it'll go directly from the state of Ohio to the school they go to. Um, it used to go, a lot of this money, money would go to Hicksville, then keep have to turn around and send it to the private school where the student was going to go. Now the money's going to go directly to the private school. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big, big supporter of what the way Hicksville does. I mean, I, and I'm not just saying this because Keith is over there. I really think highly of Keith Countryman. I really think highly of your school system here in Hicksville. You guys are doing a wonderful job here. Um, but I also believe in, in school choice, okay? So I think the parent, you know, they ultimately should be able to make that decision where they want to educate their child. And, um, and I like what we did in this budget. The money now, instead of Keith having to figure out where all this money goes, Ohio's gonna send it directly where the child goes. So that's a really good thing. There's something else to work on, because I agree that that's a choice, yeah. their choice. But if they choose to send them there, I still have to provide the transportation. Yeah. That's bull crap, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is odd. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I There's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> if they choose to go there, fine. But yeah. why do I have to transport them there? Well, you should yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> why, why we're on education, one, one, <laughs> without being controversial, do you see anything happening with the critical race theory uh, yes. conversation in the schools? I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, we have two bills in the House right now that would make critical race theory against law to teach in public schools. Okay. They can do whatever they want in private schools. I mean, but in public schools, if we can get one, either one of these two bills passed, um, it would outlaw or it would ban any form of teaching of critical race theory in the state of Ohio in our K through 12 schools. And college, actually, I think one of the bills is written in public universities as well. That's yeah. very wise, yeah. frankly. <laughs> yeah. High priority, I think it's I think very good chance. It's a high priority. Here's I'm trying to get political. Our, I'll just say it this way. Our General Assembly is very conservative. All right. We have, we have um, a, a super majority of, of Republicans in the House and the Senate. In the House, there's 99 members. 64 of us are Republicans. In the Senate, there's 33 members. 25 are Republicans. So we can, you know, we will and we have continued to pass conservative legislation. And, and I am very certain we're going to pass one of these two bills this fall that deal with the critical race. Do you know the number? I don't. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you.